my lecture about the parameters affecting the ICSI cycle and its impact on the cycle management and outcome. Uh, uh, what are the predictors of ovarian response? Um, all of us know that the endocrine and the follicular reactions of the ovaries to hormonal uh, stimulation have been described as the ovarian response. Ovarian response, this endocrine and the follicular reactions. Uh, what is ovarian reserve? Ovarian reserve refers to the quantitative or quantitation of residual primordial follicle in the ovary and represents the reproductive age of the uh, woman. Uh, treatment individualization in IVF should be based on predicting the ovarian response for each patient. So from this point that we have to know that uh, we should individualize and we should uh, 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 tailor the protocol of stimulation for each patient uh, which may be different from the other patients depending on the ovarian reserve and of the different factors that I'm going to, to talk about. What are the uh, predict uh, uh, predictors of ovarian uh, response? Uh, here, uh, the primary task for us is to classify the patients on the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, to normal patients, poor patients, and the uh, hyper responder patients. Uh, uh, we have a hyper responder patient. Then we have to choose the ideal treatment protocol for the patients. So, first we have to classify the patients into normal, poor responder, hyper responder. And then we have to choose the ideal treatment protocol for them. From this, we, have, uh, we, we, we can get a more precise information regarding the possible outcome during the IVF cycle. We can have the information about if we are going to have a prolonged treatment, uh, the expectation of cycle cancellation, the ovarian hyperstimulation, the possibility of ovarian hyperstimulation, the treatment burden, this is very important, especially for patients that having uh, a poor response or that we have high cost of treatment. And also for those patients, we have to have an idea or precise information about the reduced success. Predictors of ovarian response should be based on the most sensitive markers for ovarian uh, stimulation. Uh, what are the predictors of ovarian response? We have a group of predictors of ovarian response. Uh, we'll start with the most important, this is the age. The age, this one of the most important predictors for the ovarian response. Then we have the BMI, based, uh, uh, body mass index. We have, uh, it's an important clinical parameter. Uh, or predictor for ovarian response. And this is the menstrual cycle characteristics. It's very important if you have a prolonged menstrual cycle or if you have a short menstrual cycle or short follicular phase. From here, you can have an idea uh, about the, uh, the ovarian response. Uh, another point is the previous IVF response. This is also very important, the previous IVF response. Uh, two main very important parameters that we have to use them together, which is the AMH, uh, anti-Mullerian hormone, and the AFC, which is the antral follicle count. Uh, another point, uh, presence of ovarian cyst, and I'll mention it at the end of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, We'll start first with the uh, one of the main parameters about the uh, the pr uh, prediction or of the ovarian response, which is the antral follicle count. All of us know that the prediction of in vitro fertilization outcome at different 
antral follicle count thresholds combined with the female age, female cause of infertility and ovarian response in uh, this uh, paper uh, presented in the fertility, uh, uh, it's not fertility, anyhow, uh, 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 here from this uh, graph we can find that if we look for the antral follicle count, this is very important, starting from one down to, uh, from one to 20, 23, and you will find that this is the clinical pregnancy rate. You will find that we have a, a, a gradual increase of the pregnancy rate till we reach the number of 15 follicles. After 15 follicles, you still have a, a, a very slow increase in the pregnancy rate till you reach about the, the, the number of 20 or 25 follicles. After that, you will have a plateau in the pregnancy rate. So this is the main point uh, that with the increase of the antral follicle count, you have to expect an increase in the pregnancy rate, but the best uh, uh, antral follicle count that uh, uh, you have to expect is the count of 15, but if you have more than 15, you will have a higher cumulative pregnancy rate because you will have higher chance for oocyte freezing. Okay. Uh, here, you can look for the clinical pregnancy rate in those patients. If you have an antral follicle count from 1 to 8, from 9 to 12, from 13 to 17, more than 18, you will find that there's a progressive increase in the pregnancy rate from 28% up to 40% with the increase of the follicular count up to 18 follicle, up to 18 follicle. Uh, uh, more than 18, you will have more uh, 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 a cumulative pregnancy rate, you have uh, more uh, follicles ready for freezing, uh, or, or size or embryos uh, uh, ready for freezing. Uh, Anterior follicle count are strongly associated with live birth rate after assisted reproduction with superior treatment outcome in women with PCO. This is a fertility strategy paper in uh, 2011. And here you can see this solid uh, line, this solid line uh, between the antral follicle count here and the pregnancy rate. And you will find that there is a gradual increase of the pregnancy rate uh, till they reach the uh, 15 follicles uh, and to up to 20 or 25 follicles. Then we will have a plateauing of the pregnancy rate after that. Uh, after that, you will have just increase in the number of the oocytes and embryos ready for freezing. Also, if you look for the antral follicle count less than five from, five, from six to 11, 12 to 23, and then after 23, you will find that if you look for the pregnancy rate, almost the same results. The pregnancy rate here is almost of 20% at increased gradual 25 to 30 and to 40 uh, one percent if you have a follicle count more than 23. Uh, an important point is that if you look for the consumption of the gonadotropins, you will find that there is a decrease or decline in the consumption of the gonadotropins with the increase in the number of follicles. If you have a high number of follicles, you will have a reduced consumption of the gonadotropins compared with higher use of uh, uh, ampoules of stimulation if you have a lower number of follicles. The second point is the anti-Mullerian hormone, AMH level and uh, outcome in expected poor response. This is from the Middle East Fertility uh, Journal. And you will find that uh, uh, when you have a very low AMH, 2.8, uh, uh, picomole, not uh, uh, picogram, not uh, 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 sorry, uh, picomole, uh, which is عشان تعرف ال 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 اسمها إيدي البتاع بتاعتنا اللي هي نالوجرام بتقسم على سبعة. فـ 2.8 دي معناها إن هي 0.4 اللي إحنا متعودين عليه. فهنا ال كل الparameters دي ماشية بالpicomole, not the uh, uh, and sorry, uh, nalumol, not nalogram. 
هنا احنا ماشيين بالنالو مول هتلاقي ان في عندنا الكانسليشن ريت عالي اولموست 50% كومبيرد ويذ ذا 16% كانسليشن ريت If you look for the pregnancy rate, low pregnancy rate about 16% compared with the 40% pregnancy rate if you have a higher uh, anti-mullerian hormone. Here, anti-mullerian hormone, almost uh, 2 nanogram uh, uh, per ml. Okay, uh, we have to divide uh, the patient response uh, into three main categories. Uh, the first category is the poor ovarian response. Poor ovarian responders are identified on group of characteristics. These characteristics, some of them are clinical and some of them uh, bio data and other are laboratory investigations. The, the, the first and the most important is the age. We know that with increasing age, you have to expect a poorer response, uh, but actually you can find uh, uh, some young girls that have poor response. Uh, an important clinical point is that the short menstrual cycle. With increasing age, you will find that short follicular phase. With the short follicular phase, you have to expect that you have a poor response. Another uh, clinical point from the history of the patient, if you have a previous uh, history of previous IVF cycle with a poor response, also here you can expect a poor response for the patient, or you have a previous ovarian surgery, ovarian cyst or ovarian abscess or whatever uh, done for the ovary, or on some cases you can expect it for those cases doing uh, ovarian drilling. Uh, uh, furthermore, uh, we, we look for the uh, uh, anti-mullerian hormone. This is a, a biochemical parameter and ultrasound parameter, which is the AFC, which is the number of follicles. The disadvantage of this, the disadvantage of using ovarian reserve markers is that there is no accurate cutoff level. This is very important. There is no accurate cutoff level for predicting over, poor ovarian response. Studies show, show uh, 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 varying values of AMH and AFC in predicting poor ovarian response. For example, the cutoff value for the AMH ranging from 0 0.7 up to 1.2 nanogram per ml. And for AFC, be less than 5 to 7 follicles in both ovaries. Uh, uh, those two parameters, if we uh, combine them together, you may have uh, an ideal uh, predictors for the poor ovarian response. However, uh, uh, it's an important point about the poor ovarian response is that predicting the poor ovarian response may not result in significant improvement in treatment outcome. If you know that this patient is a poor responder, uh, in many cases, whatever you are doing, the end result is poor. So uh, you can predict a poor ovarian uh, response for the patient before starting stimulation. This is very important for counseling the patient for poor response, very important for counseling the patient for high cost. But uh, in many cases, you cannot, you cannot improve the treatment outcome in those patients. If you look for uh, uh, the novel uh, Poseidon stratification for the poor responder patient, uh, <laughs> the concept is to have a better stratification of women with low prognosis in ERT. This is one point. The second point, depending on this better stratification, you can individualize the therapeutic approach in each group, having as an end point the number of the OSAs required to have at least one euploid embryo for the tra for transfer in each patient. This uh, Poseidon stratification, it depends on four categories that had been suggested based on quantitative and qualitative parameters as follow. First is the age of the patient. 
age and the expected aneuploid rate. The second point, ovarian biomarkers. Ovarian biomarkers, very important is to have the AFC, antral follicle count, and the AMH, antimullerian hormone. And third is the ovarian response provided by a previous ART cycle that was performed, if you have any information about that. Okay. This is the uh, Poseidon uh, classification. Poseidon classification for the poor responder patient, we have four groups. The group one and group two, those are the unexpected, unexpected poor or those patient having suboptimal ovarian response, unexpected suboptimal ovarian response. If you look for group one of those patients, you will have patients, young patients less than 35 years, having adequate ovarian response. If you look for the AFC, you will have count more than five or seven. If you look for the AMH, you will have AMH more than 1.2, 1.2, okay? If you look for group two, they are the same parameters except that they are the older patients. Group one, younger patients, less than 35 years. Group two, more than 35 years with the same criteria, adequate ovarian uh, reserve parameters, AFC uh, uh, more than five, AMH more than 1.2, but at the end, when you start stimulation, you will face unexpectedly poor or suboptimal ovarian response. Both these groups are subclassified into 1A, 1B. 1A if you have less than four OSIs obtained from stimulation, and 1B if you have a moderate number between four and nine. This is after standard stimulation because in those patients, if you have good AF, AFC and uh, accepted AMH, you will go for a standard stimulation, not a uh, uh, higher dose stimulation. Group three and group four, those are expected poor response. Either you have a younger patient, uh, less than group three, less than 35 years, group four, older patients, more than 35 years. Both of them have uh, uh, a a a a AFC, uh, antifocal count, less than five, and AMH, less than 1.2. This stratification is very important because uh, group one and two, Actually, those unexpected, unexpected response. But you can uh, 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 define this unexpected response, as Dr. Hisham said, around day five or day six of a stimulation. And here you can modify or change uh, some uh, of your stimulation protocol. Either you increase the dose of FSH or you can add LH if you are using only REC FSH or FSH only without uh, HMG. Uh, group three and four, from, from the start of stimulation, you have to start with a higher dose of stimulation because you are expecting this uh, poor response. The second group of patients are those which are the normal responders. Normal responders, uh, two main parameters uh, uh, should be uh, uh, fulfilled. Uh, the AMH should be more than 1.2 up to 3.4 nanogram per ml, and you have an AFC uh, more than 8 and maybe up to 14 follicles uh, by uh, transvaginal ultrasound. The hyper responders, if you retrieve more than 15 oocytes following conventional stimulation, uh, here uh, you are dealing with a case of hyper response. Predicting high response is based on clinical criteria and patient characteristics, which is very important. You, you have to know uh, uh, be, beforehand, before starting a stimulation, are you going to uh, face a case of hyper response or normal response or hyper response? Uh, you have to evaluate the uh, age of the patient, young age of the patient. Prolonged menstrual cycle, if you have an oligomenorrheic patient, if you, have, if you are dealing with the PCO patients, or a patient having a history of hyper response, or if you have an AMH more than 3.5 nanogram per ml, 
and AFC more than 16 follicles. Uh, this is a graph uh, uh, showing the antral follicle, uh, the AMH and the antral follicle count. Here, AMH from zero up to five nanogram per ml, and the AFC antral follicle count from zero up to 20. And you have here the three different zones, uh, each one after the other. First, if you have an AFC uh, up to 1.2 and the follicles up to 5 to 7 follicles, not more than 5 or 7 follicles, you have to expect poor response. If you are expecting poor response, uh, you, you, there are a lot of measures that we'll talk uh, uh, in a few minutes about the stimulation protocols and the doses of the stimulation and what type of protocol you have you, you can do but uh, 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 in most of cases in most of cases you cannot uh, uh, modify the response of the patient uh, significantly but uh, uh, the main your main objective in those patients the poor response patient you have to counsel the patient very clearly about the high cost and you have to try to minimize the treatment burden uh, and uh, all of us know that the, the accepted protocol and we'll see it later is the antagonist protocol with the maximal FSH or FSH HMG stimulation. If you go for the middle zone which is the normal expected normal response from 1.2 up to 3.5 or maybe up to 4 and number of follicles reaching up to 15 follicles this is the expected normal response patient here your main objective is to maximize the success rate you have to have a higher you, the highest pregnancy rate that you have and uh, also the highest freezing rate if you have a good freezing protocol. And here you, you can go with the standard treatment protocol and we'll mention this in a few minutes. If you go to the extreme uh, end of the, of the group, those patients having FA, AMH more than four and follicles more than 15, you, are, you have to expect a high responder patient. And in the high responder patient, the main, your main issue and your main objective is safety of the patient. Here, the main objective, safety of the patient, is to minimize OHSS, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. You have to minimize it. You have, oh, I think all of us have to forget about the OHSS syndrome. Uh, here, uh, uh, the safest protocol, there are a lot of protocols that we'll talk about it, but the safest protocol is to go for the antagonist protocol, minimize your FSH stimulation, and go for the GNRH, GNRH uh, uh, triggering and freeze all uh, uh, protocol. Okay. Uh, uh, the last point uh, is the, uh, what are the different stimulation protocol and what is the initial uh, gonadotropin dosage that we need for the different uh, 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 protocol for different groups of patients. Slide it up, Kibira. Okay, here, uh, 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 we have three groups of patients uh, regarding their response. We have the lower group, this is the low responder group, this is the normal responder group, and this is the high responder group. If you are facing a low responder group according to the criteria we mentioned, according to the Poseidon classification, according to the age, AMH, 
uh, AFC and the previous ovarian response, uh, menstrual pattern, whatever. If you have a low responder patient, either you have a choice to go for the antagonist protocol or to go for the agonist protocol, either any one of them. But if you go for any of them, you have to go for a high uh, gonadotropin dose. Uh, I think most of us go for the 300 uh, units uh, uh, per day. And I personally prefer the antagonist protocol, not the agonist protocol. Uh, since a long time, I use the antagonist protocol. I know that uh, uh, there are the decent results regarding the agonist protocol, but actually I stopped using it for, since a very long time before. If you go for the intermediate group, which is the normal responder patients, uh, also you can go for the antagonist or the agonist group. And here you have a moderate dose of stimulation, but actually here 150 to 225, but actually it is recommended not to go for 150, but you have to go for two to five uh, to uh, ensure a good number of follicles, ensure good number of mature oocytes, and subsequently you, you have a good reserve for uh, a fresh transfer and for uh, freezing. Freezing is very important. It, it should be one of your main goals. So uh, my recommendation is not to go for 150, go for at least two to five uh, uh, unit of gonadotropin per day. If you go for the hyper responder patients, this is a very risky group of patients because of ovarian hyperstimulation. So you have to be very cautious in this group of patients. Uh, uh, either to go for the antagonist protocol if you have a good experience with that or still you can go for the agonist protocol. Uh, whether go to antagonist or agonist protocol, you can go for 150 uh, for the antagonist protocol. For the agonist protocol, you can go for 100, 125. Actually, clearly uh, 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 for the hyper responders, uh, I used to go for two to five also, because uh, with, with the antagonist protocol, there is no fear at all uh, uh, from, ovar from ovarian hyperstimulation. And the second point, in some of those hyperresponder patients, you may face unexpected poor response. You may face unexpected suboptimal response with the uh, 150. So I think uh, it is uh, wiser and safer to go for two to five, three amps, amps per day of the gonadotropin and no fear uh, from OHSS because you can uh, end your stimulation protocol if you have a very big number of follicles with the uh, 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 GnRH agonist trigger. But if you go for the agonist protocol, no way you have to go for a lower dose of stimulation. You have to go for 100 or 125 or maximum 150 gonadotropin per day because here you cannot give, uh, uh, you, can, you cannot trigger your cycle with the GnRH agonist. You have to give at least uh, 250 from uh, uh, you have to use at least 250 from uh, uh, gonadot uh, gonadot uh, 250, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 2,500 of the HCG. No way you have to give an HCG for this cycle, so you are still at the risk of uh, operant hyperstimulation. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, a routine. Uh, we do ultrasound monitor for the size of the follicles, for the number of follicles, see the endometrial thickness. You, uh, you, you can measure the estradiol level. Uh, and uh, with this ultrasound monitor, follicle size, follicle number, endometrial thickness, estradiol, you can tailor your dose of stimulation and the days of stimulation. And at the end of the stimulation, in the low responder patient, you can uh, trigger you, your cycle by HCG, 10,000 unit, or uh, you can rec, give REC HCG, uh, uh, 200 and, uh, 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 250. Uh, this, if you have an accepted number of follicles. 
uh, if you still have a poor response, uh, no follicles, very poor ovarian stimulation, despite continuing stimulation up to maybe eight or 10 days and don't have any good response, you, will, uh, uh, you are obliged to go for cancellation of the cycle. In the normal responders, you can give for uh, uh, the 10,000 HCG, or if you are planning for freezing, uh, for whatever reason, you can give decapeptil only or GnRH agonist only. Uh, in the hyper-responder patient, this is the main concern. This is the patient or this is the group of OHSS. Here, if you are giving uh, uh, antagonist group in those in this patient, you can give, uh, you can give, uh, you can trigger with the two ampoules of decapeptil or GnRH agonist and go for freeze-all uh, protocol. Uh, but actually, if you are using the agonist protocol, GnRH agonist protocol, no way. You have to go for 5,000, or the minimum dose you can give it is uh, 2,500. And here, either you can go for fresh, or you can go for uh, uh, freezing the cycle. And, uh, if you are uh, dealing with an agonist protocol and you are facing a case of hyper response and you are facing a case of eminent ovarian hyperstimulation, I think it is safe to go for cycle cancellation more than to go for uh, HCG triggering because uh, here you are inducing an iatrogenic uh, 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 ovarian hyperstimulation. So in this group of patients, the hyperresponder, I think safety is more important than pregnancy. But if you want to combine safety and the pregnancy, you have to go for the antagonist and a trigger with the agonist uh, trigger. Uh, another point about uh, uh, what is the effect of the luteinizing hormone and the estradiol hormone in the early follicular phase of the gonadotropin releasing antagonist cycle. Uh, this uh, debate about this uh, point, but I'm not going to talk about it. But there is a paper that uh, is compared to the fixed stimulation protocol, which is the loan, the the solid, and the interrupted line, which is بتاع الفليكسبل بروتوكول انتاجونس بروتوكول ريجاردينج دي ال اتش ليفل ريجاردينج ذا استرادايل ليفل اند ذا دايز اوف ستيميليشن يو فايند هير ذات ويز ذا فيكسد بروتوكول يو هاف ا لوور ليفل اوف اوف ال اتش اند لوور ليفل اوف اوف اي 2 هير فيكسد مينز ذات يو ستارتد uh, your uh, antagonist, GnRH antagonist, on day five of the stimulation, okay? The flexible protocol means that you start it when you have a follicle more than 14 millimeter. Okay, this may be on day six, day seven, day eight, but actually the, the end result is that the fixed protocol, especially in those patients having a higher number of follicles, the patient of fixed protocol, uh, uh, give better results than those of the flexible protocol because with the flexible protocol you have a higher LH, higher E2. With the higher LH, you expect that you have a premature L, a premature progesterone rise. This premature progesterone rise will affect the endometrium, uh, have an adverse effect on the endometrium, uh, will lead to advanced endometrium maybe more than two or three days that may have a negative impact on uh, on the pregnancy rate in fresh uh, transfer. So, uh, if you have a high LH, high E2, early in the follicular phase, you have to expect that if you have a flexible protocol, you have you are facing a poor uh, pregnancy rate than the fixed protocol in the fresh cycle. Uh, last point about the endometrial thickness and uh, the uh, the frozen uh, embryo uh, transfer. Uh, 
uh, if you look for uh, the endometrial thickness, you will find that uh, with the thickness more than seven millimeter, you have a better and decent pregnancy rate. More than eight, you have a good pregnancy rate, the same as seven millimeter, but uh, as you have a thinner endometrium, you have to expect a poor pregnancy uh, uh, outcome. The clinical pregnancy rate and the uh, is lower, and the uh, abortion rate is higher. Uh, both the clinical pregnancy and life birth rate decrease significantly for each millimeter increment below eight millimeter in the fresh, and below seven millimeter in the frozen. So, your main idea, your main target or goal in the in the frozen embryo transfer that you have an endometrium more than seven millimeter. Last point is the ovarian cyst. I know that it has no place in this presentation, but uh, uh, I ask, uh, uh, they asked me to just make a small hint about the effect of different types of ovarian cysts on the antral uh, follicle. Actually, uh, to make the long story short, uh, if you look here for the endometrioma and the functional cyst. If you have an ovary with a cyst and ovary without functional cyst, you will have no difference in the number of the antral follicles and number of the oocytes retreat from it. But if you have an endometrioma, with the endometrioma significantly, you have a lower number of antral follicles uh, in the ovary with the cyst than the ovary without cyst. But in the a rationale or this is uh, an excuse to do surgery to improve the uh, uh, antral follicle count and oocyte retrieval from the ovaries with the endometrioma. Thus, does surgery for endometrioma increases the, the probability of a spontaneous pregnancy. Endometritic cysts neg negatively affect ovarian reserve. Nevertheless, uh, there is a strong evidence that excision of the endometrioma leads to further decrease in the ovarian reserve. This is very important. Excision decreases the ovarian reserve. And there is no evidence pointing to an increase in population following endometrial uh, endometrioma excision. There is a low quality uh, evidence suggesting that endometrioma excision improves fertility. The guideline development group recommends the decision to operate on endometriomas to be individualized, having considered other factors, the bilaterality, the ovarian reserve, the accessibility of uh, oocyte aspiration in this. This is the uh, picture for the ultrasound picture for the uh, endometrial uh, uh, chocolate cyst, and this is another picture for the endometrial uh, cyst, just to remind you uh, uh, that surgery is not recommended even, even if you are looking for spontaneous pregnancy or for IVF because you are uh, uh, negatively uh, impacting or affecting the, the pregnancy. Uh, thank you for your attention.